Good afternoon everyone and welcome to Midlife Cruises. The Midlife Cruisers are uh, from Norway as you may know and uh, we are proud of our seafaring history. Even we admit that the uh, Vikings could have been a little nicer on its raid around Europe. But what uh, many cruise enthusiasts uh, may not know is that Norwegian shipping companies played a pivotal role in the establishment of the modern cruise industry as we know it today. And in this uh, first episode of the Norwegian influence of the modern cruise history, we look at Knut Utstein Kloster, the owner of Kloster Shipping Company, established by his uh, grandfather in 1924, and how he became that many consider the founding father of the modern cruise industry as we know it today. So, right after this. Fifty years ago, the cruise industry was in its infancy when Knut Utstein Kloster, a third generation Norwegian shipping executive original in bulk and tanker businesses, made his first move into an unknown market of leisure cruising as we know it today. The great liners traveling the Atlantic between Europe and the US was at its end, being replaced by airlines. But Kloster, a humanitarian and a very innovative businessman, saw the potential of creating a business based on the ship itself, being a destination and a platform for holiday experiences. So, in 1966, Norwegian Caribbean Lines saw the day of light. The preface of Norwegian Caribbean Lines was really an upscale ferry and a passenger transport from England to Gibraltar. This route was to be served by the newly built Sunward, a name chosen because the English could go to the sun in Spain with a new ship. But it was a very short-lived success. As many know, Spain was still ruled by the nationalist General Franco and the restriction on English currency and the closing between the borders of Spain and Gibraltar placed a fate on the newly built ship. So Knut Kloster found himself with a ship but no route to sail. This changed when he was approached by a man named Edwin Stefan from Florida, who had been owner of the just defunct Pan American Cruise Lines. He had used a ship, the Egyptian ferry Neely, that he had chartered out to a man named Ted Arison. Because Pan American had gone bankrupt and the ship was laid up, Arison was also desperate for a new ship because he had a lot of passengers that wanted to sail his popular Miami, Haiti and Jamaica service. In this misfortune of both Kloster and Arison, they found each other and formed Norwegian Caribbean Lines, the forerunner for Norwegian Cruise Lines as we know it today. Sunward's first cruise from Miami started on the 19th of December 1966 with three and four days cruises to the Bahamas. For cruise historians, this date is recognized as the start of the modern cruising history. The Sunward was a revolutionary vessel, 8,666 gross ton built in Bergen, Norway. She was designed as a long-haul ferry service. She featured a new level of luxury, including accommodations for 558 passengers in cabins with private baths, restaurants, bars, a nightclub, theater, and a shopping arcade as well as air-conditioned system able to handle the tropics. She was a great success from day one. Her success led to a rapid expansion of Norwegian Caribbean Lines. Norwegian Caribbean Line led away with its introduction of a fleet of sleek new white ship. First, the MS Starward in 1968, and the Skyward entered service in 1970 with cabins replacing her car decks to increase capacity to 920 passengers. She was follow followed by the next year by NCL's fourth ship, the 16,600 gross ton southward, which would sail 14-day cruises to 10 Caribbean ports. Ted Arison broke the link with Kloster in late 1971 and established Carnival Cruise Lines. A fierce competition started to unveil in the Caribbean after Norwegian Caribbean Lines, Carnival Cruise Lines, Royal Viking Line, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines and several others all wanted a piece of the pie. Most of these companies were Norwegian owned or had a Norwegian background, but the only one to use the name of the home country was Kloster. 
In 1979, Kloster bought the former transatlantic liner SS France, and at the time the largest passenger ship in the world. The ship had been laid up since 1974, and Kloster saw a huge potential to outdo his rivals. She was refitted for cruising in Bremerhaven in Germany, and in 1980 she entered service as Norway, a vessel that was three times as large as any cruise ship then in Caribbean service. The vessel was baptized by the King of Norway on May 3, 1980 in Oslo, and her maiden voyage came to New York on May 16, 1980. It was thought that the gigantic ship of the transatlantic age were unsuitable for the new role that they had to play. But Norway was an instant success and she paved the way for a large, for large purpose built cruise liners. As Norwegian Caribbean Lines was becoming a real world leader, the company was awarded with the possibility to fly the flag of United Nations on Norway, something that no other ship ever was able to do. So Norway really started it all and Kloster was a big man in Miami at that time. The ship was refurbished in 1990 with more decks and had a capacity of 2,350 passengers. SS Norway came to a sad ending with a boiler explosion in Florida in 2003 and was tugged to Europe for repairs, but never to return into service. She was decommissioned by Norwegian Cruise Lines in 2004 and was scrapped on the infamous Along Beaches in India in 2007 and 8. The Phoenix Project Already in 1983, the innovative Knut Kloster had a big ideas for the future of the modern cruise industry. The biggest ship at that point was 70,000 gross ton. Kloster had much bigger vision with the Phoenix project, a 250,000 gross ton ship accommodating 5,200 passengers in four multi-level hotels with private balcony. That is the size of the biggest ship today in 2020. Cluster's dream was to create a cosmopolitan floating city about the sea able to offer fun, culture and work. Amenities would include everything from 13 restaurants to 2,000 seat theater, 30 shops in a city center, a planetarium, extensive spa and health facility with tennis courts and ice skating rinks, and a four-pool lagoon with sand beaches. The Phoenix project would also incorporate Cluster's broader vision with a university campus, a campus and meeting and exhibition spaces. <clears throat> there is no doubt that you can draw lines from the Phoenix project to the grand engineering that was materialized in the Oasis class ships from Royal Caribbean in 2009. In 2000, the Norwegian influence of the great cruise company was over. The ownership went to the Asian-based Star Cruises, later also a big chunk of the company is sold to American investors. But I'm still proud to see that most of the ships still being named Norwegian. We hope you enjoyed this episode of our series, the Norwegian influence on the modern cruising history. If you do, please like and subscribe. We will be back with more episodes and the next one will be looking on Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines that also was established in little tiny Norway. <laughs>